What do you believe was the originating cause of you and your brother ultimately winding up shooting your parents? Um, me telling. You telling what? Me telling Lyle that, uh... <laughs> you telling Lyle what? <laughs> was it you telling Lyle about something that was happening? My dad. a leading question? My, if you don't uh, ask my dad. Just look, wait one second, Mr. Hennig, is okay? Let me ask No, no, he was in the process of answering, so there's no need to ask him. Can you answer the question? Yes. Okay, was you telling Lyle what? My dad had been me. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Ramblin' Mama. I'm Lisa. Today's episode is a continuation of the Menendez brothers' trial. We're gonna go over the events leading up to the murder, Lyle's cross-examination, and then finally, Eric's testimony. And in the next video, I'm gonna be getting into trial number two and the aftermath. I tried to make this video a little bit shorter than the last one. Let me know down below if y'all prefer having these shorter format, my sh shorter, you know, 20 to 30 minutes versus longer format, like the one last week was an hour long. I'm going to issue another warning about the contents in this video. Again, it covers a lot of graphic abuse. I censor it heavily, but still it's physical abuse, essay. If that's in any way triggering to you, please click off now. A friendly reminder that I am not an expert. This is based on my research and the research of Molly Robichaux. Thank you again, Molly, for all your hard work. So in the community poll that I took, the majority of people said that they prefer when I'm on camera like this talking versus doing a voiceover and showing you images primarily. My only fear about that is when I'm in front of a camera, I feel like I go on more tangents, but maybe you're okay with that. Let me know in the comments below. I hope you enjoy this one. And without any further ado, let's get into it. So as you may have gathered from Lyle's testimony in the last video, the essay with him was far briefer than it was with Eric. It started for him somewhere around six, ended somewhere around eight, inexplicably. But for Eric, it had been going on for years and years and was continuing to go on even at the time of the murders. So Eric was out of his mind wanting an answer to his prayer for his father to stop essaying him. And he thought with college coming up that he would finally be able to escape the abuse. But in August of 1989, right before the murders, Jose and Eric had a conversation where Jose made it clear that Eric was not going to be staying at the dorms at UCLA. Eric had hoped to go off to Princeton and share an apartment with his brother Lyle. And even Kitty, was pulling for Eric to be able to go to Berkeley. There was a tennis coach who was going to bat for Eric and he basically said he had a limited amount of spots that they could allow for students to get in based on the recommendation of a tennis coach. But in order to do that, he had to have some guarantee that Eric was actually gonna use that spot. It seemed very promising. Maybe if Eric didn't have the ability to make it into Princeton and to be with his brother Lyle and get far away from his family, maybe he could get away to Berkeley and start a new life there. Eric went back to him and he said, Said, look this coach is gonna vouch for me Jose said absolutely not you are going to UCLA and further just to show you how far out of his way Jose went for those of you who might be a little skeptical Jose made a special arrangement that Eric wouldn't stay at the dorms full-time he got special permission for that so imagine you're Eric and from the time you're a little boy you're suffering from this abuse at the hands of your father and he's so domineering and overbearing and intimidates you into not telling anyone and you think your only option might be turning 18 and being able to move away from home and you even go as far as to line up 
choices for yourself. And we know based on Jose's history, he highly valued Ivy League schools. And based on that, you would think that he would be thrilled with Eric, who didn't do so well academically, getting into a school like and not only are you to go to UCLA, but you can't even stay in the dorms there. So after Eric gets this devastating news, he's deep in despair, contemplating suicide even, like he had earlier in his life. But instead, he conjures up the courage to tell his brother Lyle about what's been going on. Right around this same time, when Eric was planning on approaching Lyle with this dark secret, Lyle and Kitty got into an explosive argument which culminated in Kitty taking him by the hair of his toupee and ripping it off. The way that his toupee was secured in his hair, it was, from what I understand, part of his hair had to be removed in order for it to sit more flush and for the adhesive to work. So when she pulled off his toupee, it wasn't like pulling a hat off of your head. It was extremely painful and it removed some of his skin along with it. Not to mention how humiliating it was to Lyle. Because like many things in the Menendez house, this was one of his secrets and Eric wasn't even aware of the fact that Lyle was wearing a toupee. Another side note about this hairpiece, Jose was the one who actually insisted on Lyle being fitted for it and wearing it. Jose had this idea in his mind that Lyle was going to be a politician, which speaks again to more of Jose's narcissistic projections onto his children. They were to succeed in sports the way he did and his mother did. They were to go to Ivy League schools, I guess that applied to Lyle and not Eric, the way that Jose dreamed of doing. And Lyle, at least, was expected to become a politician the way that Jose actually had dreams of doing. According to the brothers, Jose had a plan to at some point down the line move to Miami, become a politician, and advocate for the liberation of Cuba. Sorry to get on a tangent there. Okay, back to the timeline. Eric observes this altercation between Lyle and Kitty, with Kitty removing his toupee. And Lyle storms off into a little guest house that they have, and Eric follows him. Eric says something to him along the lines of, there's so many secrets in this house. And he reassures Lyle that he doesn't care that he has a hairpiece and is trying to make him feel better. And he tells his brother that dad is still doing it. Now at first, Lyle is confused about what Eric even means by this. I think it was some level of denial that he had. So he asks him what the heck Eric is talking about. Eric tells him the essay has been continuing. Now, Lyle actually confronted Jose about this. When Lyle was about 14 years old. He heard sounds that gave him the impression that Jose was essaying Eric. Now remember, Jose had only stopped essaying Lyle just a few years before. I can't even imagine the level of courage that it took for Lyle to approach Jose about this as a young teenager. And he tells his father to stop it, to leave Eric alone. What Jose said to Lyle at the time is that Eric lies sometimes, but to keep this secret between the two of them and to not be worried about it because it was going to stop. Lyle was very much blindsided and infuriated by this news, but he gathered his composure and made a plan on how to confront Jose about this. When Lyle finally approaches Jose, he had already prepared what he was going to say. He was feeling terribly nervous about it, but he prepped himself the way that Jose taught Lyle by listening to music and calming himself down. It was a Lionel Richie song that he was listening to in order to center himself and essentially visualize how this scene would go down. Lyle confronts Jose about it and Jose basically tells him that Eric is his son. He can do whatever he wants to him. And he told Lyle to mind his own business. And Lyle tells him that he's going to go to the police and also tell the family. You can imagine Jose Menendez is not one to be threatened or cornered. What he says to Lyle is ominous. He says, 
We all make choices in life. Eric made his, you made yours. What Lyle made of this is he and Eric's lives were in danger. Because both the boys had been threatened with their lives at some point by Jose, he had told both of them at different points that if they were to disclose the abuse to anyone, that they would lose their lives. And now Lyle gets the courage to confront Jose after all these years. And he tells him, essentially, Eric made his decision to disclose this information to you, even though I threatened him with his life. And now if you choose to disclose it to the authorities and our family, you also will suffer the same fate. This was also paired with very odd behavior that the brothers were picking up on from the parents. I'll get into more of that later in the last episode when I go over my reactions. Suffice it to say, based on this exchange, the brothers were in fear of their lives and Lyle in particular was motivated to put together a plan to save themselves. Now this next part I found the most devastating and you tell me if you agree. Four nights before the murder, Jose bursts into Eric's room and he throws him down on the bed and Eric said that was the angriest he'd ever seen his father. Eric struggled and was able to escape and he ran downstairs and upon hearing this struggle and exchange, Kitty looks at him and says simply, I've always known. What do you think? I'm stupid? So in the span of a few days, Eric had found out that he was no longer being offered a lifeline. He also finds out that Lyle is bald and has been hiding it for years. And Lyle finds out that the essay that he thought ended when Eric was younger had continued on and on and on until today. And finally, to me, the worst revelation that Kitty, their mother, who's supposed to protect them, knew that this was happening. Her young sons were being repeatedly essayed by her husband, their father, and did nothing to stop it. This destroyed Eric. And they were on that shark fishing trip the day before the murders. And he told Eric, things could have worked out in this family if you would have kept your mouth shut. Okay, so we talked about in the last episode how effective Lyle's testimony was. It was incredibly moving to not only spectators, but also members of the jury who were visibly moved. However, when Pamela Bazanich cross-examined Lyle. She did it over a four-day period. And Robert Rand in his book reported that you could see the toll that this cross-examination was taking on Lyle. He was physically depleted by it. He was hunched over in his seat. And towards the end, it appeared that he was supplying responses without considering them much beforehand. He was that whittled down. What Bazanich was doing in her cross-examination was belittling the abuse that Lyle testified to. And this is another thing that I'll get into in my commentary at the end of this series, but it appeared that Lyle remained as strong as he possibly could in the face of that. Bazanich was ultimately able to get Lyle to admit that his parents did not own guns and that they did not explicitly threaten Lyle and Eric. On September 27th, Eric began his testimony. In my opinion, Eric didn't come off as well as Lyle did. It's clear based on accounts and even the differing actions of the brothers that Lyle was the more outgoing one who wasn't as uncomfortable being in the spotlight. Eric was much more shy. Even today, Lyle welcomes people to write to him in prison, whereas the statement that Eric has made is that he prefers to be private and doesn't want to release his address, even though now they're at the same prison. So if you know Lyle's, you know Eric. But I think part of this that complicates Eric's extreme discomfort at being in the spotlight is the level of shame that he carries. Brene Brown says that shame eats secrets for breakfast and man 
I've never seen a more clear example of that than the Menendez family. Eric actually blamed himself for the essay, which sadly, a lot of child essay survivors experience this. He thought he was a coward for not standing up to his father. Although he did really make a stand against Jose when he was 17. And Jose, in response, held a knife to Eric's throat. One good illustration of what Dr. Vickery characterized about the brothers being developmentally stunted. Eric believed that Kitty had magical powers. And one reason for this is because Kitty always seemed to know about different things happening in Eric's life, even if he didn't discuss it with her. Well, after the murder, when the investigators went through the Menendez home, several tapes were found that he had in her possession. They were phone recordings of Eric's conversations with his girlfriends. Eric also stated in his testimony that he would have journals that he kept that would just disappear. I feel like there are a million different illustrations about how boundaries were non-existent in this family. That magical thinking Eric had was the defense illustrating that the brothers were infantilized by their parents. The defense had several experts come in and testify on the brother's behalf, including a psychologist who was from Salt Lake City. She said she thought the brother suffered from a condition known as learned helplessness, which occurs as the result of repetitive abuse. And it just so happens that I was reading this book recently that talks about an experiment that illustrates learned helplessness. So I'm gonna read a quick passage to you about that. In the early 1960s, scientists conducted animal experiments to determine something about the flight instinct in humans. In one experiment, they wired half the bottom of a large cage so that a dog placed in a cage would receive a shock each time it set foot on the right side. The dog quickly learned to stay on the left side of the cage. Next, the left side of the cage was wired for the same purpose and the right side was safe from shocks. The dog then reoriented quickly and learned to stay on the right side of the cage. Then the entire floor of the cage was wired to give random shocks so that no matter where the dog lay or stood, it would eventually receive a shock. The dog acted confused at first and then it panicked. Finally, the dog gave up and lay down, taking the shocks as they came, no longer trying to escape them or outsmart them. But the experiment was not over. Next, the cage door was opened. The scientists expected the dog to rush out, but it did not flee. Even though it could vacate the cage at will, the dog lay there being randomly shocked. From this, scientists speculated that when a creature is exposed to violence, it will tend to adapt to that disturbance so that when the violence ceases or the creature is allowed its freedom, the healthy instinct to flee is hugely diminished and the creature stays put instead. Wow, so first of all, I'm sorry to animal lovers out there. Secondly, how powerful of an example of learned helplessness is this? I think this is totally apt in describing what seems to be going on in the Menendez house. And it also makes me think of Gypsy Blanchard, which is the case that I'm definitely gonna cover at some point in the future. Y'all let me know what you think about that experiment and its application to this case. Now, Kitty's family did not take kindly to these accusations, and they were very outspoken to both the media and the defense. Kitty's brother told one newspaper that his sister did not abuse their children. and. If anything, he felt like Jose and Kitty did not discipline their children enough. Another defense witness was a medical doctor and director of the child abuse team at Martin Luther King Hospital in South Central Los Angeles. The doctor reviewed Eric's medical records from 1977, so this would be around when Eric was about seven years old. He saw that he had a quote, hurt posterior pharynx, uvula, and soft palate healing well. The doctor stated that this could have been an injury caused by oral 
essay. On cross-examination, though, the prosecution got to admit that the injury could have been caused by any number of factors and wasn't conclusively essay. The prosecution called several rebuttal witnesses after the defense rested their case, such as Kitty's brother, as we mentioned before, who said that Eric had a puffed up ego. The prosecution gave their closing arguments and told the court that the brothers were spoiled vicious brats who got the best defense that their daddy's money could buy. The prosecutors also said in their closing argument regarding Eric that he was not abused, but he was in fact a homosexual, which is really, forget insulting, but confusing. But the reasoning that the prosecutor had was, Eric obviously had shared a lot of details during his testimony about the essay. The prosecutor theorized that the reason that Eric knew about all these explicit details was because he was a homosexual. Make it make sense. Further, the prosecution claimed that Jose was not essaying Eric at all. In fact, he was infuriated by the fact that his younger son was gay. As you'll recall, Kitty had fears about Eric being gay, and that's why she tasked him with getting a girlfriend within six months. I believe that was after they moved from Calabasas to Beverly Hills. On January 13th, 1994, Eric's jury announced that it was deadlocked and unable to reach an agreement on any of the counts. One week later, on January 25th, 1994, Lyle's jury also announced that they were deadlocked and unable to reach a verdict. So the judge declared mistrials for both cases. So I guess mistrials are kind of a mixed bag when it comes to the defendants. On the one hand, great that they weren't convicted, but on the other hand, it needs to be tried again and that means more time and more money. The one thing that the defense did seem to have a victory on was that only three of the jurors on Lyle's jury voted for the most serious charge of first degree murder. And on Eric's jury, only five did. And again, I feel like Lyle getting three versus Eric getting five, if anything, based on the evidence and the testimonies, it looked like Eric had the most motive of all right? He was the one who was trapped. We'll see in the clips that I'm playing next from Eric's testimony. Testifying is a skill for sure. And I think that it comes more naturally to certain people than others, which isn't any indication of truthfulness. It's simply an indication of a person's comfort level, ability to communicate while being on display and add to that shameful secrets and acts abuse that these brothers endured, that they were terrified to even admit to their brother, or in this case, because it was televised, the world. When I play these clips in the segment coming up, I want you to let me know what you think about Eric's testimony versus Lyle. Eric endured more abuse for more years, but in my opinion, I think Eric's extreme shyness doesn't make him as accessible to a jury. Whereas Lyle is much more open and I think that openness lends to people being moved more easily. But you watch it and you let me know what you think. What do you believe was the originating cause of you and your brother ultimately winding up shooting your parents? Um, me telling. You telling what? Me telling Lyle that, uh... You telling Lyle what? <laughs> was it you telling Lyle about something that was happening? My dad. Can I ask a leading question? 
My, if you don't uh, ask my dad. <laughs> Wait one second, Mr. Hernandez. Okay, let me ask. No, no, you. he was in the process of answering, so there's no need to ask him. Can you answer the question? Yes. Okay, was you telling Lyle what? My dad had been <laughs> me. And did you want something from your brother? Is that why you told him? I just I wanted to stop. Were you seeking help from your brother? Yes. And when you were in Israel in 1990, did you feel that seeking help from your brother was why your brother was in jail? Yes. Mr. Menendez, during the summer of 1989, were you being arrested by your father? Yes. And when did that begin? How old were you? I was six years old. That we put up on the board some weeks ago. The series is 223 to 230. Why don't you look through those and tell me if you remember seeing those when they were last put up in this file? Yes. Are those pictures of your sixth birthday party? Yes. Other scenes of that day? Yes. Now, do you know, can you remember whether or not the moment began before or after your sixth birthday party? Um, I was right around then. I believe it was just after. Excuse me? I believe it was just after. After? Mm -hmm. Over the course of the 12 years, did the type of sexual activity that your father engaged in with you vary and change? Yes. Were there patterns to the behavior so that there were actually different kinds of sexual incidents with your father? Objection Overall. Yes. And did you come over the years to give those different kinds of sexual incidents names? Yes. And would you tell us what were the names that you gave to those different types of incidents? Um, knees. Uh, knees? Knees. K-N-E-E-S? Yes. That was one type? Yes. What was another type? Um, nice, nice, sex. Nice. What yeah. was another kind? Um, rough sex. Rough. And was there another kind still? Yes. And what name did you come to give that kind? Just sex. You called that sex? Yes. And was that that you called sex some form of? Yes. When before your father died was the last incident of what you called? Um, in May. Of what year? 1989. And when, before your father died, was the last incident of knees? In August. Of what year? 1989. And that last incident of knees took place in what location? My bedroom. The bedroom that Detective Zoller was just identifying photographs of? Yes. Over the course of those 12 years, between age 6 and age 18, where did most of the sexual incidents with your father take place? In my bedroom. Starting at which house? In Muncie. And did 
episodes of sex activity between yourself and your father also take place in the next house you lived in on Mill Road? Yes. And did similar incidents occur when you lived in the house in Pennington on Lakeshore Drive? Yes. And were there incidents in the fancy house on Mountain Avenue in Princeton? Yes. And were there incidents in the rented house in Calabasas? Yes. And were there incidents in the big mansion in Beverly Hills? Yes. Can you just put this in the picture? What would you tell us? How, where were you with your father for that first talk? I don't remember uh, what the restaurant's name. I think it started with an H. Um, I was out for breakfast uh, with him. At a restaurant? Yes. And do you recall approximately how many days after you returned from Kalamazoo this took place? Just a few days. I can't tell you the exact day. I can't, I can't you tell you. Speak up. I, I, can't tell you speak the, up. I can't tell you the exact day. You were alone with him? Yes. And what did he, uh, what was the conversation about? Uh, it was about what I was going to do uh, in college, after college. It's about what you were going to do in college and? After college. Okay. And what, uh, who was, uh, who was doing the talking? Were you telling your dad what you were going to do in college? No, my, my father was telling me that uh, um, after college, he wanted, he wanted me to take um, uh, business and economics uh, as my major. And after college, he wanted me to take this, uh, I guess, this special program at UCLA, this business uh, law school program um, that combined it in a certain amount of years. And, uh, and then after that, he said that we were going to, or he was going to move to Florida right at the end of that, and we were all going to go into business. He was going to go into business with me. <laughs> Who's we all? Lyle, Mom, me, Dad. Okay. So he was telling you what your future was going to be? Yes. Is this the future you had planned for yourself? N n no, but I mean, I hadn't really planned a future for myself. You hadn't decided what kind of work or career you were going to do, had you? No, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. Now, how important was this idea in your mind that going to college would end the mullet by your father? How important was it? Yes, how significant a notion was this? It was the most important thing in my life. It was everything in my life. It was all I thought about. Why was it all you thought about? I don't understand. All right. Why was it all I thought about? Yeah. Because it would end the second. That's all I thought about. How did you feel at 18 about the fact that your father was having I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. And what did you think your options were with respect to with your father? Uh, options? I had no options. Well, let me ask you this. Did you, over the course of that, uh, well, did you, over the course of the preceding three years, ever consider yourself? Yes. And what was the reason? Is because it would end this. And that's all I wanted. And had you ever tried to end this through confrontation? or violence against your father? Yes. Yes? You were violent towards your father? Oh, no, not violence, no. But I said no to him once. You said no once? Yes. How old were you when you said no? I was 17. And was there a reason that you gave him for saying no? Not that I gave him. Was there a reason, though? Yes. What was the reason? I just, I couldn't take it anymore. I didn't, I didn't want it anymore. And I, I was really in a, a bad state that day. And 
And he just walked in the room and I said, no. He walked in the room and there were certain signals and things that he would do, which we'll get to later, about that told you that. Let's not lead the witness. Okay. Were there certain things or signals that he did when he walked into your room that told you that he wanted some kind? Yes. And did any of those things happen on that day when you said no? Yes. Now, without going into the details of it, um, on that particular occasion, after you said no, did your father become upset? Yes. And did he do anything violent? Yes. And would you just tell us, not what happened, but just generically, what violent things did he do? He threw me on the bed and uh, went to get a knife and uh, put it at my throat. Put the knife to your throat? Yes. And was there something your father that day? Yes. Was it that fourth kind that you called? Yes. Sex? So that's going to be it for me today. Let me know in the comments down below what you think about Lyle versus Eric's testimony and any other thoughts that you have about this case. Let me know what your preferred style of presentation is. Do you like these chatty on-camera presentations or do you prefer voiceover? Are you okay with hour-long videos or do you prefer it to be a little bit shorter, like 20 minutes? All right, y'all, that's it for me and I'll see you next time.